Hi everyone, welcome to a medieval costuming adventure. I'm Daisy Victoria, and today we are going to be exploring a super cool medieval costume from the 15th century. You may have noticed I'm in a bit of a different location today. I am actually outdoors enjoying the winter wonderland. I am up at my mom's house where I have my long-term storage. And that means that at long last, I am finally retrieving a lot of my medieval things. So I'm pretty excited to have all of that stuff back so I can share it with you guys again soon. Since I didn't have my lighting equipment with me, I thought I would try filming outdoors in natural light. It is actually very, very cold. It's been below zero with the wind chill in Fahrenheit, like around minus 20 Celsius with the wind chill. Sometimes it gets a little bit warmer, but I'm handling it well and I'm actually enjoying the scenery quite a lot. I am working on a project which I'm very excited about. And this pink ruffled kirtle is a part of that project. It's actually gonna be a strawberry dress when it's done. Instead of putting strawberries all over my dress, a la the Lyrica Matoshi inspiration that was very beautiful, I thought it would be fun to turn myself into a medieval strawberry. Because why not? I already love picking strawberries and eating them, and they say you are what you eat, so it's only fitting that I become a strawberry. This is the underlayer for my strawberry dress, but it's also a dress all on its own. I chose a light pink because I thought that made sense for the inside of the strawberry. And also it's a color I'd like to wear on its own. The dress itself here is the same pattern I used for my standard medieval kirtle found in lots of 14th and 15th century images. I have a PDF tutorial for that dress, which I will link up here and also in the description. And if you want to make this dress with a ruffle at the bottom, keep watching and I'll show you how I did it. I'll explain how to adapt the tutorial to add a ruffle to the dress and also how to make it sleeveless. Over the years, I've been collecting some really interesting images from 15th century Flemish artwork and I started to notice a very cool detail that pops up sometimes. Some dresses in these images look like they have a ruffle at the bottom of them. And the more I looked for it, the more it started to pop up. But what's with the ruffle? It is present in a number of images, yet it doesn't seem to be that common overall. Most of the time, these dresses are found as an underlayer. Now there are exceptions, like this awesome image of dancing peasants, where you see it on an outer dress. I do think that makes sense because throughout the Middle Ages and Renaissance, we see a lot of dresses that could be worn as the outer layer, or they could be worn underneath another gown. For example, a winter gown, something you put on for warmth, a court dress, something for a special occasion, and so on. Also of note is that in that dancing peasant's image, it looks like the ruffle dress is a sleeveless dress worn over a dress with short sleeves or at least the short sleeves look like they're a different color. Since most of the ruffle dresses are worn underneath another dress, it's not possible to say for certain what the sleeve configuration is on all of the ruffle dresses. So that means I get to pick the sleeve configuration I want. I chose to make this dress sleeveless based on a couple of reasons. I do have some examples of sleeveless dresses from the 15th century, and I hadn't tried that yet on this particular style, so thought this would be a great opportunity. Since I'm wearing another long sleeve dress over this in the final project, I thought it would make sense to make a sleeveless underdress as we do see images of sleeveless shifts in the period. Plus, I live in the very warm south. Okay, warm is putting it lightly, it's downright hot, which sounds super ironic to say as I sit here amongst the snow, by the way. And anyway, it sure would be nice to have a sleeveless linen dress for when we have events again, whenever that happens. I've been wanting to explore this ruffle for so long and it was finally time. I'm tackling the question of this ruffle through my lens of functionality and practical construction. So I'm doing an experiment. This particular dress is made of linen. In period, we see linen and wool dresses. I chose linen because it's going underneath a wool dress. I considered how I wanted to try this ruffle. There are a couple of thoughts on construction here. One thought is that this is a separate piece of fabric which is made into a ruffle and gathered or pleated onto the dress. This would certainly help to add volume and it could be decorative too. Another thought is that it could be a longer cut of the dress and then that extra length is folded up and gathered into place. It would have to be gathered since the bottom would be wider than the point at which you are attaching it. Whether it's a separate ruffle or it's folded up from the skirt, 
It's reasonably common to have some sort of reinforcement on a hem at this time period. And in fact, we do see a lot of contrasting material used there. I really do think it looks evenly gathered or pleated on the images from the period. And trying out the folded up version, just kind of using a dress I'd already made, didn't really give me that desired effect because it didn't really want to gather up evenly. So to my eyes, I believe it looks more like the pleated on ruffle. I found that both methods would have taken me about the same amount of fabric. So my other question, does one method save fabric, in my particular case was a no. No matter which way you do the ruffle, it will add some weight to the bottom of the skirt, which is really nice for adding some body. So I cut out my pattern pieces a little bit shorter than the normal length of the gown. And basically I have this much left for the ruffle at the bottom. I did calculate this a few different times in a few different ways. And I was really good about cutting out because I actually ended up with more fabric here than I had wagered and that's great. So I must have moved the pieces a little bit closer together when I was actually doing the cutting. That's awesome. This is what happens when you buy the fabric before you've calculated how much you need. I actually did not have enough for what my ideal length of the ruffle at the bottom would have been. However, I do have enough to make it work. So I was kind of overestimating how much I needed but it turns out I do have enough for what I now think is probably a more realistic amount. So basically, I'm going to cut this entire piece I have left into straight sections, which I'm going to use as the ruffle for the bottom of my dress. I ended up cutting my ruffle about twice the width of the bottom of my skirt where I wanted to attach it. That gave me plenty of body without it being too excessive. And I think that looks like the period images. I also doubled over my fabric. Honestly, I have kind of a thinner linen and not only did doubling it over help me to achieve more body here, it also helped me to be able to machine sew the inside and I don't have any visible machine stitches. So here's the lowdown on converting my tutorial for the ruffle. First of all, my ruffle took about two yards of fabric and that is doubled over. You might need more or less depending on how tall you make the ruffle, like how far up from the bottom of the skirt it goes. You may get away with one yard if you just make it a single and not doubled over. When you cut out the kirtle, you're going to subtract some length from the skirt and then the ruffle will replace that length. Some of the period images show small ruffles about several inches, while some show much taller ruffles. If you want to double it over like mine, you need to cut twice the length you want plus seam allowance. If you just want to fold over and hem the bottom, then you only need the ruffle length plus the seam allowance and the hem which I probably would have done if I had made a much taller ruffle, so that way I wouldn't have so much bulk higher in the skirt. The ruffle needs to be about twice the width of the entire skirt where you want to attach it. After preparing that very long ruffle piece, it gets pleated or gathered onto the skirt. For my dress, I used knife pleats. I marked equal placement for the pleats on both the ruffle and the bottom of the dress by dividing the length in half, then dividing that in half again, then in half again, over and over until I had a desirable pleat size. Then I matched up my markings on the ruffle and the dress and sewed them together, pleating as I sewed. Because I doubled over my ruffle, I was able to sew this on the machine and finish the raw edges with my serger. And that is all hidden on the inside, so I have no visible machine stitches. If you use a single layer ruffle, you will hem the bottom of the ruffle piece and then also pleat the top of the ruffle onto the dress. After all of that very careful measuring out and pleating, I actually do not have the pleats perfectly even, and I will show you why. It's because the regular pieces of the dress, like the front and back pieces, are actually slightly bigger along the hem than the side and back gore pieces. And while it's probably not the end of the world, it's going to drive me absolutely bananas. So 
I am ripping out the entire ruffle and fixing it. Let this be a lesson to you to not take for granted the fact that your pieces may be the same size when they may in fact not be the same size. Another note on using my tutorial to create this particular sleeveless style, you will obviously not make the sleeves and for the arm openings, you will create facings that match the cut of the arm openings, the same way as the facing for the front opening. The armhole facings are attached the same way as the front and back and neckline opening facing, stitched down and turned to the inside. Here I'm using some decorative top stitching to secure it in place. For this dress, I decided to top stitch around the neckline and arm openings using a contrasting color in this lovely sort of magenta hue. I'm using DMC embroidery thread, which is 100% cotton. For the front opening, I spent approximately 1,000 hours sewing eyelets by hand. Okay, it was possibly closer to 10 hours, but after a couple hours, it's all the same, right? I also made the finger loop braided cord by hand, and I filmed tutorials for both the eyelets and the finger loop braid, which I will link for you up here and in the description. Well, I was up at my mom's house this month getting my medieval clothes out of storage. I thought it would be great to go ahead and film the final reveal of this dress while I was there. And we happened to get snow. I thought it would be nice to have a change of scenery for this reveal. And well, this is certainly a change of scenery, especially considering it's more of a summer dress, you know, without the overdress I haven't made yet. So this photo shoot only took like five minutes. And I am wearing modern snow boots with yak tracks. That's not because winter friendly medieval footwear did not exist, quite the contrary. It's just that I don't have any since I reenact in the very hot climates of the South. Special thanks to my mom who helped me with these shots. We were both quite cold by the time we got this footage, <laughs> but I think it was totally worth it and we had a fun time. I still have a hood and the main wool outer gown I need to create before I truly transform into a medieval strawberry, but we are getting there. I'm really, really happy with this ruffled dress. I've wanted to do it for so long and I really like it. I think it's so lovely. And here is the pink dress worn underneath another outer gown, this time a brown wool one that I've had for a long time, as well as a red wool hood. So this kind of gives you an idea of what that ruffle kirtle looks like as an underdress, even though I will eventually be making a red strawberry dress to go over it in the next few weeks or so. Wearing all these wool pieces on top definitely felt a lot better for taking photos outside in the snow. And I had a lot of fun doing this. Since I don't normally live where it snows, I am actually very excited whenever I see snow and playing in it is something I find very magical and super fun. If 
If you want to see the rest of the pieces as I make them and thus learn more about medieval clothing, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you see those. Be sure to follow me on social media. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, and even TikTok as Daisy Victoria. My website is daisyvictoria.com. And thank you so much to my patrons who help to support my continued efforts of creating beautiful garments and sharing them with all of you. I hope you have a magical day. Stay warm if you're in the snow like I am right now. And I'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye.